cool. There we go. So um, today I am uh, happy to introduce uh, Lauren Moreno, who is a senior consultant and the director of community impact with Catalyst LLC, which is a uh, consulting collective serving uh, mission driven leaders and uh, organizations uh, in her um, uh, facilitation, or sorry, in her facilitation work with Team, she enjoys creating space and systems that unleash the power of groups to envision and realize the future they want to see. Lauren has spent over a decade developing and leading innovative science communication programs at both Pacific Science Center and the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. She has facilitated training workshops and provided mentorships for hundreds of STEM professionals seeking to develop and practice their communication skills. Lauren emphasizes that effective science communication is never about dumbing it down. And at its core, science communication is about creating meaning and relevance for your audience, whether it's your mom or the evening news reporter. Lauren has served as a principal investigator or in leadership roles for several National Science Foundation education grants and served on the Institute for Learning Innovation Board of Directors from 2015 to 2021. She's end endlessly fascinated with exploring new science topics these days, often driven by her two years old, two year old perennial question of why. Uh, welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for that introduction, Krista, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I am uh, so pleased to be a part of this conversation about science communication and really honored to be um, invited by Women in Science. I um, have been able to collaborate with Women in Science over the years, uh, mostly when I worked at OMSI and um, have just met a lot of really incredible people through the organization. So thank you for having me. And I'm really excited for this conversation today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then I will get going. All right, I think that should be right. Does that look good, Krista? Perfect, it looks great. Okay, great. So here we are. Um, there are uh, numerous topics around science communication um, that we could explore, but what we're really gonna drill in on today is all about um, crafting relevant messages. Um, so we'll talk about why that's important um, in a minute. And you already heard a great long introduction for me, so I will not uh, dwell on this, um, but uh, just wanted to highlight that I have a kind of a long experience working in informal science education. Um, I got to uh, spend some time touring science exhibits and shows around the Northwest, um, whether that would be to uh, daycares or libraries or fairs, or I even took a science show one time to Bill Gates' house <laughs> for his kid's birthday party. So it was a whole kind of variety of um, settings. Um, but then I really got into how can we um, bring science professionals, um, STEM professionals, scientists, engineers, people who work in STEM um, in, contact with public audiences in ways that they can connect meaningfully and really have meaningful conversations that leverage what we know about effective science communication and how people learn to um, have real impact. Um, and so I led the development of a national model that um, did this work. And a key piece of that was um, providing professional development more, not as much quite like this, but more in-person um, professional development experiences that really uh, grounded scientists in thinking about how people learn and how um, to improve their own science communication practice and then actually uh, practice that in the museum. Um, as Krista said, now I work uh, for Catalysis LLC and I'm really focused on designing and facilitating gatherings and processes that help organizations and teams do meaningful work. So that's like strategic planning or um, facilitating uh, conferences and meetings, uh, things like that. Um, we have kind of a bent towards working with uh, STEM organizations um, because of my background in that area. And I find it that it continues to be useful. Um, but thinking about science communication is really an area of passion for me. So um, I'm excited to be here. 
And I wanted to start a little bit with some kind of big picture thinking about science communication and what is the kind of current best theory around how we should approach science communication. And so just in a kind of a one minute snapshot, wanted to say that we've really moved um, in the field of science communication from thinking about the public understanding of science to public engagement with science. So it used to be a long time ago that, you know, people felt that, okay, if people don't understand science, um, if the public doesn't understand, or even if students don't understand in a classroom, then what we need to do is give more facts and say it louder and be clearer and just repeat ourselves, right? And that there must be something wrong with the public or the students if they're not understanding. So it was kind of a deficit-based model. And what the field broadly has moved towards is really thinking about um, public engagement with science. So we know now that people learn based on um, what they already know, what their beliefs are, what their feelings are, um, and that if we want to have an impact, we need to take that into account. And engagement is really characterized by having uh, two-way conversations, by offering people opportunity to reflect and think about new information and new content um, that you may be bringing to them. And so, and I think this is really applicable whether you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation or, you know, designing a, a science movie or an article or a book or something, just um, paying attention to what the audience is bringing into the situation is, super helpful. And that's what public engagement is all about. So once, um, you know, we're thinking about that model, then it becomes increasingly important to really pay attention to, well, how people, how do people really learn? Um, and so for that, I want to just uh, briefly, I'm going to give you a snapshot of the contextual model of learning. And this really comes out of work that is focused on how people learn in informal environments, so really out of school, um, but I think it's applicable for in school too. So what we know from research, and this um, in particular was led by um, John Falk and Lynn Dierking, um, is that we know that people learn in this space that pays attention to the personal context, like what their personal um, beliefs and interests are, the soci socio-cultural context, so um, what is happening in relationship with others, um, cultural norms, um, events, activities, and then also the physical context. So that could be anything from at the time that they're learning, are they physically comfortable? Can Is the text accessible? Um, is it striking kind of all of those different pieces? Um, and paying attention to all of those different contexts as we design uh, communication experiences and learning experiences uh, really pays off. This, um, this uh, helps us do public engagement with science much better. So something to pay attention to and something that I think um, you know, educators really think about and is also best practices in science communication to really pay attention to this. So given this, given that our goal is public engagement with science, to have that really rich um, two-way engagement, and we know we need to pay attention to this broader context and um, make these meaningful experiences, what does that tell us about how we should design science communication messages? And so for that, I've got one more kind of diagram. And this is really, this comes, from um, AAAS uses this in some of their science communication uh, training materials, um, but was adapted from a book called Escape from the Ivy Tower, A Guide to Making Your Science Matter by Nancy Barron. Um, and I've adapted it a bit, but it just, given what I just talked about, about the importance of this broader context of learning, we also really need to think about our audience, right? So 
there is a strategy for how to convey information most typically when you're talking to researchers or maybe not even talking to researchers but writing so thinking about scientific papers or poster presentations or um or formal lectures or presentations that typically um, and in many cases not exclusively but in many cases the strategy is to really start with the background, that that is where you have the, the greatest breadth and depth. What are you building on? Um, and then getting to what are the specific supporting details? What is the question at hand for a particular area? And kind of getting in there. And then you may end with the results of a particular study or area of work, and then very specifically conclusions and recommendations. And this has, is appropriate for communicating with researchers in many cases. But when we think about talking to public audiences, we want to flip this on its head a little bit. And the strategy that we know from science communication research that's most effective is to go the other way around, that we want to start with capturing attention, do that at the beginning, and uh, get them, get uh, whoever our audience is, get them invested in the questions we're thinking about and kind of intrigued. Um, maybe something unusual. Uh, maybe it's how does, you know, X, Y, Z connect to their lives. It's some, some way that their attention is captured. And then really be able to communicate the so what, right? So like, why is this important? And then depending on the story you're trying to tell, you get to, at that point, what are the relevant supporting details for that particular story or for that particular message? So one of the things that I've learned over the years with talking to um, different STEM professionals is that it can be really helpful to dig into this question of so what? Um, and sometimes, STEM professionals are so in the practice of talking to researchers on this side that the gut reaction is to really begin with background and maybe uh, include too much background before really getting to the so what. And at that point with the public audience, you may have lost their attention. So I wanna ask you all this question and take you through a little exercise to help um, uncover your what, your why, why your work is important. Um, so I'm going to ask you all to grab a piece of paper and a pen or a blank Word document, whatever you're most comfortable with. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions and give you um, a little bit of time to reflect on each one. And I will get my uh, timer out here so that I can watch the time. I'm going to get that ready. Okay, I'll try to stop it before you hear my <laughs> timer music. Um, all right, so you have your paper and pen ready. Here is your first question. Why are you looking watching? So why is your work important? Um, just answer that question. Um, however, it, however, uh, your first instinct is to answer it. Um, I'm going to give you uh, one minute.
All right. Um, your notes can be messy. They do not need to be clear, clean ideas. Um, just get it out, your first thoughts on why is your work important? Let's go to the next question. Also, I should introduce, this is my sweet daughter, Olivia, who was uh, almost three at the time, I think that we took this. She's now almost six. Um, and I have another uh, two-year-old that asks very similar questions uh, right now, Simon, but this, this is Olivia. So let's hear from her again on with the next question. Why is that important? So why is that important? So look at what you wrote in response to the first question. Why is your work important? And follow up, well, why is that one important? Why is that important, what you just wrote? Um, take another uh, minute to jot down some notes here. All right, um, and you can guess where I'm headed. I am just gonna do this one more time to take us to the last question. Why? My uh, perennial question from my kids, why? Um, the latest one from my daughter is why, or what? what is the, the um, how was the first human born? Which is such a great question when you really want to ground it in um, evolution. And so we're, we're slowly getting there. So I, I'm answering a lot of whys as I'm talking about that, but that's my latest challenge um, in response to this girl. But I want you to imagine that you're talking with someone and you have that, why your work is important. Why is that important? Now try to back up one step further and look at what you just wrote and uh, reflect why is that important? And we'll take uh, one more uh, minute on this. All right, I will stop uh, sharing there for a moment and uh, come back to see you all. And um, I'd love to just hear whether that's in the in the chat or if anybody wants to come off mute really quickly, like how did that feel to go through those questions? Easy, hard. For me, the first two felt all right, but the final one, like taking it that one step further, was a little bit challenging for me. Yeah. 
Did anybody else feel that way? Personally, yeah. I was a little shocked by how seldom I wind up thinking about that, um, that much of a big picture for my work. Yeah. Sometimes drilling down, it just can, it can get to that level of like, to make the world a better place, right? Or because life is important, you know, you can get to some really fundamental issues, but that's really helpful when we think about science communication, because that helps us identify what are the core areas that people are going to connect to um, about, uh, about your work. Sometimes this exercise, I think when I first um, found it in some source, the, the way it was written up was like to do that seven times. Um, so I won't, I won't do it. I won't do seven wise, but you can imagine how that could be useful at different times um, to do that just with yourself as you're, especially um, when you're thinking about areas of work that feel uh, either abstract or not very tangible to really uh, push and try to articulate, um, articulate this. So we're gonna go ahead, actually now, I want you all to have um, just a few minutes to connect with one of your colleagues here and chat um, and share a little bit about the specifics of what you wrote down in your notes around why your work is important. You don't have to go through everything that you wrote, but just kind of actually practice saying it out loud, like why is your work important and what's the maybe deeper and deeper level of that. Um, we'll have just five minutes, so just take like, you know, two or three minutes um, per person. Yeah, let's do actually, Krista, let's, we're good on time, so let's do six minutes. And then that gives us a clean three minutes per person. And then we will come back together and move on to the next thing. So Krista, make, make your magic on the breakouts. Okay, almost there, I think. Just one moment just checking okay everyone will have two or three people per breakout room it looks like how that's how google is setting it up so uh here we go wonderful i think um we're all uh reconnecting thank you for um taking the time to connect with each other um how did that how did that feel any um kind of insights or things that you shared with your um, partner or how you're you're feeling about this question of why that you want to share with the whole group? I'll share yeah. one. Um, I thought that it was kind of nice to have a child asking the questions of us because it it made you kind of think about like how to explain it really simplistically, like how you might to a child. Um, and so I, that was kind of a nice prompt. So thank you. Mm, that's good. I find that, um, I find that to be helpful and it's helpful, a helpful reminder because we sometimes make this assumption that, um, oh, if it's an adult and particularly if it's an adult kind of in my field or with a science background, like, they should get it. I don't want to demean them by, you know, not explaining things that so you might kind of um, may not be quite right. And so to step back and, and really try to make it not, um, not, uh, what's the word, not dumbing down, really anti dumbing down, but to how can this be interesting and, and meaningful to a child or to anyone is super helpful. Any other reflections? Uh, yeah, I had a conversation with Ujwala and um, I thought she put, brought in an in interesting perspective and I, I approached the exercise as like, why would this my work be important to another person? And she approached it and uh, she also approached it in a different way and said, and, mentioning why her work was important to her as well and her the fulfilling aspect of it and i and then i thought that was really interesting as well because it's a way of con what the person would connect to you and what you find the fulfillment that you find in your work which i didn't even mention or think about mm, that's really great 
I think that's so important. Both are really important. And to think of, um, you know, both of those layers. I often think that it doesn't matter what somebody is studying. Like if somebody is super passionate about something, I just tend to be more interested right? Because you feel their their passion. And if you can kind of connect to why they think it's interesting, um, it's inspiring. So it's it's a great thing to connect with people about. Anybody else have any reflections? One thing I think we talked a little bit about is that we don't necessarily have practice doing this. Um, Like we all had different levels of having done this before either being new ourselves and having heard it explained to us explaining it to our young children or just not really having any occasion to need to explain your work and it's a great reflection to to do sometimes and really think about why you are doing what you're doing yeah yeah it seems so basic but we don't do it necessarily to like go back to that core and it often like the most elegant, simple explanations of things are often the hardest to um, like develop and make clear. Well, the next thing that we're going to um, focus on here is just thinking about how you can really center the audience in front of you. And I often, you know, as I'm talking to scientists and thinking about science communication, um, I think it's really important to um, just recognize that to to not make assumptions about the audience in front of you, right? Like the audience um, in front of you may have a lot of background knowledge or they may not. Um, In many cases, you may expect that they don't have background knowledge and they might. Um, you know, they may have a background in your area of science or have a particular interest or have personal experience, you know, with a disease or, you know, have some reason that they do have knowledge or they may not or you just you just don't know. Right. So you can't make assumptions, um, but you can kind of start to build that toolbox of how you might talk to different audiences about your work or kind of start to imagine and have empathy for what um, different uh, types of people or audiences or specific people, what they may be bringing into a situation. And by just practicing that and kind of starting to think about, okay, what, why might a child um, you know, be interested in my work versus why might my dental hygienist be interested in my work versus why might this journalist that's covering something be interested and playing around with that in your head or even sketching this out on paper helps you build a toolbox of messages that might be appropriate um, for whatever audience you encounter. Um, It also like helps remind you that there are some kind of queuing questions that you can actually when you have the opportunity for a live you know interaction that you can actually ask to start to kind of touch base and understand what somebody might be interested in or um what uh what they may know about and i think that's so much more helpful to think about science communication in those terms instead of like one elevator pitch because one elevator pitch won't it, it's it's just one pitch and you're kind of like frozen in um, one set of messages. Whereas if you think about expanding your toolbox, then you're kind of ready to meet whoever might be in front of you. So I'm going to look, show, go back to my slide deck. And I have another, oh, okay, I have to share. Um, share this kind of exercise about um, your audience. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do another um, just brief exercise and I'll uh, time it for um, five minutes or so, where I want you to take a little bit of time to think about who is your primary audience that you're interested um, right now in communicating with. Now you may have a specific science communication um, platform or 
challenge right now that you're thinking about and preparing for, or you could build this out kind of hypothetically. And I, I like to, I put that primary in uh, parentheses and kind of emphasize it so that you're really forced to consider, okay, who is this for, who is this communication for first? Um, because it's really easy to say, oh, this is for everyone. Um, it is very difficult to develop communications that's actually um, going to be super meaningful for everyone. So I really encourage you to try to narrow it down and start thinking about um, building out that toolbox as it relates to uh, particular audiences. So for the next five minutes, I want you to think about who is your primary audience. I have some examples here, um, but you certainly are gonna have uh, many others. So feel free to select um, whatever feels meaningful for you to work on. And then I want you to think about for that particular audience, kind of diagram or map uh, these questions. So what do you think this audience knows about your work? Why do you think that they might care about it or connecting with or care about connecting with you? What do you think, what might they think is most interesting? What questions would you have for them? And that might be um, questions to find out um, if they know about certain things like more content, or it might be questions that you, you genuinely want their um, input on or their perspective on a, a scientific issue. And then also thinking like what might catch their attention. So let's go ahead and take um, five minutes. I'll set my timer and um, just reflect on paper um, on, on this and then we'll come back together.
Okay, let's go ahead and um, come back together for um, a minute. Um, I'm curious to hear how that went. Any um, reflections from folks about maybe the audience you chose and something kind of most interesting or striking that you kind of came to about um, how you might prepare to speak with that audience? It was certainly more difficult to do this one than the first set of three questions. Yeah, it is. And you're kind of, you're making stuff up, right? Because this mm -hmm. is not, in most cases, it's not necessarily somebody right in front of you. You're just, you're kind of imagining and you don't quite know. But it also, I think the fact that it feels difficult underscores this idea that we typically think about science communications, just like what is the message and not what is in front of us maybe coming back or what's really happening on the other side. So as we build that muscle to, and that empathy to try to think about what's happening on the other side, it, it helps us craft better messages. Any thoughts from others about how, how it felt or something um, you thought of? Yeah, I chose um, like a high schoolers as my target audience. And I was trying to sort of go back to about what most people's like knowledge base was in high school, you know, and trying to like, you know, I feel like high schoolers are particularly a difficult one because I feel like if you do talk down to them. They're like sensitive to that, right? If you're a teenager, you don't want people like patronizing you or like thinking you're stupid or whatever, um, which I guess is just like a teenager thing. So trying to like pitch what I wanted to talk about at a level that was complex enough to challenge them, but also respected um, what I think they would already know, you know? Yeah, it's challenging. That's really challenging. I feel like along Any those lines, um, like the idea of engagement came up a lot when I was thinking about it. This is my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, kitty. She's engaged as well. Um, and like my audience was a, like a, a scientific a cross-functional team at work where we're taking on a new project and I have to explain kind of the scientific background around that and a lot of what I approach that with is like thinking about what others want to know to get them engaged in that scientific question and I think um, it's similar to what Austin was saying about like approaching um knowing your audience approaching them um, from a place that is uh, engageable, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like just finding that spot. And I think, you know, doing exactly what you all just did, like taking those moments um, to just mentally ask yourself these questions as you're considering a message, um, as you're planning whatever kind of communication, um, it's just super helpful because it's it's the the muscle that's helping you really work towards that public engagement and to what we ultimately know this will have more impact. Um, but it's not easy. It's it's much harder than just like oh here's the way to do the message, <laughs> um, but it is uh, more effective. So I want to touch. Um, I'm going to close with just a couple of things and then we might have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so I'll go back to my slide deck here. Um, just, I'm just going to touch so briefly about language. Um, so once, you know, we have that message and you've really thought about, okay, well, what, why is this important? Um, to a particular audience and what might your approach be? You still have to actually you know, craft it. And so I do like to touch and think a bit about vocabulary. 
I think it's really important to emphasize that just like there is a reason why research and um, scientific research papers look the way they do, and it may be effective in communicating with other researchers and kind of in the scientific enterprise, there is also a reason for having technical and precise language. Um, but that technical and precise language may not be um, the best for engaging with public audiences. So adjusting your vocabulary is not, uh, I think I think of it as kind of a sub skill around science communication. Like I think this work around messages and connecting with people and the importance of your work is becomes uh, even more important. But if you really are grounding in that, well, why is this important and what do I want to share? You want to be able to talk about that in accessible language and relevant language. And I think I have this particular chart kind of pulled out and you can, you know, uh, see the terms that I've called out is just to to call out that there are different types of um, potentially problematic vocabulary terms. So we often think of, um, you know, jargon as just the technical terms, right? Like just and there's a bazillion you know particular technical terms that people just haven't heard but there's also a lot of words that we need to watch out for that um may be problematic because there are multiple meanings particularly when there's a common meaning and a scientific meaning sometimes there's even two common meanings and two scientific meanings so just like being really careful about being clear where there are terms with multiple meanings also, sometimes we just have words that are just too fancy. It's just a hundred dollar word, um, like elucidate. Um, and we just maybe don't need to be uh, quite so fancy, just be working on using plainer language, which can communicate uh, more clearly to a broader audience. More people will find that accessible. And then there may also be words that are just kind of a buzzword. Um, I think of nano actually kind of has that because it's been used to describe a variety of projects products that are not um, not necessarily actually uh, nano. So just things that end up with a cultural kind of buzz uh, meaning you want to be careful about. So there's different alternatives. It's not always about replacing a, a vocabulary with something different. Um, it is about maybe taking more time to explain a concept. It's maybe about replacing the term. It might be about using the term because it's important to use that term, but um, defining it as you go or reminding people about what the definition is um, because they may be hearing it from you kind of out of context of when they last learned it. So I think it's just, um, being careful and thinking through what are the words in your area of work, especially like as you talked about why your work is important, are there terms that come up when you're kind of instinctively talking about this that you'll want to think through and um, decide if you want an alternative and kind of work through some options of what that might be. If we had time here, we could do a really fun exercise and I encourage you to do this with other folks um if you have time where you just talk about your work for like two minutes and have other people somebody else um ideally a colleague not in your discipline like write down any uh, potentially problematic term that you use and then you can work through kind of what are the right alternatives together and that's that's a super fun exercise but we do not have time today for that so i will end really quick with just some big takeaways um, this is no surprise, but I feel like this is what I've been talking about the whole time, but just really thinking about science communication as a reflective practice. Um, so seek out training and engagement opportunities, practice, ask for feedback, kind of reflect on how um, your messages and strategies are resonating with your audience. Taking care and time to craft your messaging and recognizing exactly what we talked about, that sometimes having the most simple resonant message actually takes the longest to come to. Um, so 
uh, take time with that, uh, give it the attention that it that it um, demands, and also check back in with that throughout your career and um, update your toolbox. Uh, be flexible, make your message relevant for each audience, and always figure out ways to share like why your work is important. And also, I think this is kind of what some of the groups included this already. Also, like what just absolutely fascinates you, what triggers your passion. And if you can pull that out and talk about that clearly, you are surely to um, interest the, the people in front of you. And um, attend to your audience and build that two-way dialogue. Um, and that is all I have for my last uh, tips and tricks. Um, but I just wanna say thank you all so much. Again, it's really a pleasure to be here. I really um, admire and support the uh, women in science group. And I'm so, um, uh, yeah, honored to be a part of it.